Yesterday, Matt Iglesias quote tweeted me and said that had we listened to Gruber and Krauss, the two officials at the FDA who resigned, many, many people would have died before we got boosters. Is that true? Is that accurate? Does that actually make sense? So how do we come to this conversation? Well, I had seen that Peter Marks of the FDA said something like, hey, we need some more staff. We're in short supply here at the FDA, we need some people to join our ranks. And I commented that who would want to work for the FDA? Because if you work for the FDA and you believe you are a faithful public servant for decades, and then one day the White House will come and tell you how to do your job, and if you disagree, all you can do is resign. And that's what happened with Marion Gruber and Phil Krause. They were the number one and number two at FDA Drug Products, and they had to resign because they had a disagreement about boosters. What was that disagreement? Were they on the right side of history, the wrong side of history? Matt Iglesias commented about my comment, and he said, well, it turned out they were on the wrong side of history. Had we listened to them, many, many people would have died. Is that true? Well, first, I think we have to think about what they actually said. Their point of view was rather simple. It was that before we authorize boosters for every single adult American, we need credible data that it improves an outcome we care about. What kind of outcomes do we care about? We care about severe disease. We care about hospitalization. We absolutely care about those outcomes. And they wanted to see that was improved before they authorized EUA boosters for all. The White House, of course, wanted a broad EUA for boosters for all. They didn't necessarily need that data. They were happy to hang their hat on antibody titer data and say, you know what, the antibody titers are up. And, you know, in Israel, of course, they did it and things are a little bit better if they do it. There's fewer symptomatic cases. That's what the White House wanted. But Gruber and Krauss felt like that wasn't enough. Symptomatic cases were obviously not going to be enough because merely avoiding a cold-like illness is not sufficient to get boosted. What you really want to see is an improvement in net clinical benefit, which which is severe disease and hospitalization versus the adverse effects of the vaccine. That's what they wanted. They want to see some net clinical benefit. But one of the things they were very cautious about was that, of course, we can have sort of a sliding scale approach. People who are very vulnerable, we might be able to grant a booster EUA for them while we collect more data on a broader population. That was really their position. In their Lancet paper, they talked about immunocompromised. Some people say, well, they didn't talk about older people. Well, you know, they're not simpletons. They're very smart, so they fully understand that vulnerability is a combination of medical comorbidities, but also a combination of age, and I think they're fully cognizant of the massive risk gradient by age. But people ask, what would have happened if we listened to them? And I think they live in this idea that if we had listened to them, we would still be waiting for the randomized control trials, because to be honest, we didn't listen to them, and we don't have randomized control trial data for 12-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds. We just don't know if they have a further reduction in hospitalization or death from the booster. We just don't know. But if we had listened to Gruber and Krauss, the world would have been different. If we had listened to Gruber and Krauss, Pfizer wouldn't have gotten all that market share. They wouldn't have had billions and billions of dollars in market share. They would have had a huge incentive to rapidly run that randomized control trial. And they could have easily accrued for this randomized control trial. 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 people would have joined in a week if they wanted. How do I know that? Because when they authorized boosters, 300,000 worried Americans rushed out to get boosters in those ages. So of course, they could have easily accrued for the randomized trial. The alternative to what we're doing right now isn't that we would still be waiting for randomized trials in the Gruber and Krauss reality. It's that in the Gruber and Krauss reality, Pfizer would never have gotten that marketing authorization. They wouldn't have been able to capture that market share. They would have had a huge vested interest to develop that data really, really quickly. In the Gruber and Krauss world, we would have gotten that data for, we might have had a preliminary EUA in older people, vulnerable people, maybe 70 or 80 and above. And we would have quickly done a randomized trial in all comers, I think, in the United States. And we would have seen what is the magical age? Who actually benefits from boosters? Is it 49 and up, 55 and up, 65 and up, 39 and up? We just don't know. If we had lived in their world, we'd have more information. And the delay isn't as big as people think. You know, with my colleague, um, Emerson Chen, we've mapped the potential delay for doing randomized control trials in other settings. And it's not as big as people think. It's about 11 months or 11% of marketing time. So why do people like Matt Iglesias and others get this issue wrong? Why is there this narrative that had we listened to Gruber and Krauss, people would die? I mean, this is a very oversimplified understanding of regulatory science. The idea is that the higher the bar, um, the slower things are, the fewer products come to market. And yes, you're certain that the drugs work, but you've had that huge delay to get approved. The lower the bar, some things come on market that fail. That's okay because the ones that come on market and succeed far outweigh those benefits. The hurdle is low. We get things quicker. We save many, many more lives. It's a very simple understanding of the world. But the truth is, if you had a higher bar, you would actually compel the manufacturers to do the trials faster. 
They wouldn't be able to collect money hand over fist, month after month, year after year, millions of dollars. They would need to do those studies to get that market share, and that would accelerate that. And people also forget that actually, if the effect is as big as you think, the randomized trial will accrue and result really quickly because the speed with which it results is proportionate to the, effect, the event rate. It's not the sample size, it's the event rate really that's driving the result. And the trial in those young people will actually take a long, long time because the event rate is so, so low. But people also say, well, we can't do the randomized trial, it's just gonna be too big. Mm, what you're really saying is that at best case, the upper bound, the best case scenario is that the effect size of your product is really, really marginal. That's what you're saying. You're saying the effect size of your product is so, so marginal. So you have to ask yourself, is it really even worth pursuing? And the truth is, Gruber and Krauss were pushed out by the White House wrongly. Many, many people wouldn't have died had we listened to them. In fact, they were present at the advisory committee that actually voted to boost people 65 and up under EUA. People wouldn't have died. We would have just gotten a lot better data about the group of people in whom we don't have data. Colleges that instituted mandates would have had data to back it up, or they would have not done it because we would have realized it doesn't actually further reduce the risk of hospitalization or, de or death. We would have had a much better world had we listened to Gruber and Krauss. They were career regulators. They're smart people. They're much smarter than the politicians who push this decision through. So Matt is wrong, and I think a lot of other people are wrong. I think people have a misunderstanding of what happened, a misunderstanding of what regulatory science is, a misunderstanding of how long randomized take to result. They have this very simple economist framework that they've listened to on some economist podcast. It's not actually quite right because it doesn't account for the fact that when you give people a real incentive, they will get these things done. Just like the companies had a huge incentive to do the first randomized control trial. They might have even had a result in October had it not been for some changes to the statistical analysis plan that gave them that result just after the election in 2020. They had a huge incentive. They got those data real quick, didn't they? They got 40,000 people in that study real quick, didn't they? And multiple companies did it, didn't they? So it doesn't take that long when you really have a home run. But it might take longer when you have a very marginal benefit and it might take longer of course if you authorize the product because then people don't have the path to get the product is only through the trial that will actually increase your trial enrollment so those are my thoughts on this question boosters Marion gruber phil kraus had we listened like are they are they vindicated absolutely they were right um would people have died had we listened to them absolutely not was the White House wrong? Absolutely they were wrong. And they set the worst regulatory precedent. Whichever president floats into that office in the future, they can call up the FDA and say, approve this drug because I had dinner with the CEO of the company. And if the FDA doesn't play ball, they can put tons of pressure on them and they'll have to resign. Or, you know, maybe something else will happen. But that's not the precedent you want to set. And so I think this White House was wrong to pressure them. They were right. And I think this kind of narrative is misleading. The only other person I saw on Twitter who actually pointed out that Matt was wrong in a very credible way. It was Willie Jalad, the last man who remembers history. Good for him. So if you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. Until next time.